Hello. Today's uh, message will be taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. UCLA did not lose this weekend. They didn't play. They don't play again until Thursday. So. And my dad would be very happy with how the World Series is turning out. My dad is, was from Ohio, lived in Ohio most of his life, except when he was in the Air Force. So the Cleveland is leading the series and making it happy. Do you give your waitress a bigger tip if you're with people that you know than if you're not? Or if there's a homeless person, you're by yourself, you just kind of pretend they're not there and just keep on walking. But if you're with your friends, then maybe you slip them a couple bucks or you take them to McDonald's and feed them or something like that. Um, is there a difference between who you are when you're alone versus who you are when people can see you? That Jesus' words of today will probably make you uncomfortable, assuming anybody's watching you. Um, who we really are is who we are when we're by ourselves. When we think that no one can see us, when we think that no one knows what we're up to. Ideally, of course, who you are should be the same no matter where you happen to be. Now, obviously, the role that you play in life, say if you're at work, you're doing something different than what you're doing at home, and so there will be some differences. But you should still be the same basic person, as you shouldn't have a different persona depending on where you are. Uh, that is, would we recognize you if we saw you in your house? Would we recognize you when you're driving down to 14? Would we recognize you when you're yelling at the television, uh, say watching the news and you don't like what's there? How many yous are there? Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others and be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. <coughs> So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let's pray. Father, take care of us today. Help us as we go through this passage to make sense of it. Help all of us to get something from this. Bless our time together here now. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Practicing righteousness. It's almost like you're strutting around on a stage and performing sometimes. Um, peer pressure is a powerful thing. <coughs> When you go to Costco and you take your cart, you know, into Costco and you get your food and then you come out of Costco and you load your car, what do you do with the cart? Do you just leave it sitting there or do you go and push it back into the place where it's supposed to go? Is your behavior different if somebody's with you or somebody's watching you? Say the Costco guy that would be moving the carts, if he sees you, would you then make sure that you take where it's supposed to be versus if he's not there? We obsess on whether we are doing what is right or wrong. We obsess over whether people see whether what we are doing is right or wrong. Now, I have a Fitbit. That means it keeps track of my steps each day. I try to do 10,000 steps a day. I've been doing pretty good at that. If my Fitbit is charging, do my steps matter then? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, it, I'm not going to walk anyway if I don't have my business. Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> that makes no sense ultimately now, does it? <laughs> that is, the steps are still doing what they're supposed to be doing regardless of whether somebody's, you know, whether this is keeping track of it or not. If I forget to wear it at night and I don't know how many hours I actually slept, does that mean my sleep was of no consequence? No. Um, and yet that's how we tend to think about the good stuff that we do. If no one sees it, then what's the point? 
and yet obsessing about what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong, was never supposed to be what human beings did. As you go back to Genesis, and when Adam and Eve made the wrong choice that they made, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of what? The knowledge of good and evil. Not just the knowledge of evil. As we always think in terms of what we weren't supposed to know about bad stuff. But we weren't supposed to know about good either. We weren't supposed to think in those categories. That was not supposed to be the way we approached life at all in terms of good and bad. We are preoccupied with these things. Um, everything that we do, we categorize. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And it's part of our estrangement from God is the fact that we focus on what our actions are, whether they're good or bad. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. When you donate to a good cause, why do you do it? Ideally, it's because you believe in the cause. That is, this is something you believe in, this is something you care about, it's like giving money to the church. Why do you give money to church? Because you like the church, because you agree with the men the purpose of the church, and because you get tax deduction, right? <laughs> um, or maybe people would think badly of me if I, you know, if the plate's coming by and I just pass it and don't put anything into it, so I'll put something in so that people won't think poorly of me. Um, or maybe you donate to a cause because you'll get some kind of recognition for doing so. For instance, uh, how many of you have heard of Mystery Science Theater 3000? Those are the people I like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mystery Science 3000 was a television show back in the 90s where they took the most horrible movies imaginable and they had little robots and they were stuck on a space station. They had the mad scientist was forcing them to watch these really bad movies. And as they watched the movies, they would make comments about it. And it made the movies almost bearable. <laughs> they have revived that show. It's coming back again. It's going to be on Netflix. And they had a Kickstarter campaign for it to raise money so that they'd be able to get interest in reviving the show again. I donated money to that. <laughs> the reason I donated the money to that was not so that my name will be in the credits, although that will happen supposedly. And I didn't do it just so I get the mug and the t-shirt. <laughs> although I like that. I did it because I liked the show and I wanted the show to come back. It's, I really like that show a lot. Anyway, I have solar panels on my house. They're on the back. So nobody can tell that I have solar panels. Now, do I have solar panels because I believe in environmentalism and I'm concerned about my carbon footprint and that sort of thing? Not really. I'm doing it because I save a lot of money. I have received my reward in full for all these activities. There's no righteousness associated with what I'm doing. We generally have mixed motivations in giving. We don't generally do what we do for purely altruistic reasons, that is, we get something out of it. Now, Jesus suggests, therefore, that we have already received our reward for whatever good stuff that we've done. Don't be expecting a pat on the back from God, because we weren't ever actually doing it for God. We were doing it for ourselves and for the free coffee mug. Verses 3 through 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now that's a very paradoxical passage. That is, how is it that you can keep track? I mean, I'm very clumsy, so I don't always know what one part of my body versus another part of my body is doing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have mysterious bruises, and I'm not sure where they came from. But 
the point of this is, and what Jesus is saying, is that ideally we simply do what's right without thinking about is this a good thing, is this a bad thing. When I was in graduate school at UCLA, I worked at the Burbank Airport driving a shuttle bus. And one, you know, it was a Friday night. Um, there were two of us that were on, myself and another guy. And we flipped the coin, and I got the job of taking the inventory of the parking lot. At night, we would inventory the parking lot. We'd write down all the license plate numbers. So if somebody lost their ticket, we'd at least know how many days the person had been there. He then got to drive his shuttle back and forth to the airport to pick people up while I was doing that. So I'm up on the roof of the parking structure, and I hear this horrible crunching noise and screeching tires and all that. I looked over the top of the um, thing, and there is the van, smashed bits, another car, several uh, big trucks, several uh, yards down the road. So the guy had gotten hit when the guy that hit the truck had run the red light at 50 miles an hour. He was drunk. So I immediately, you know, called 911, uh, went down there, checked to see how he's doing. He was injured slightly. Uh, called the boss to let him know what had happened. I didn't think in terms of what's the right thing to do in that situation, what's the wrong thing to do in that situation. I just acted. That is, you don't. <coughs> contemplate, you know, is this a good thing I'm doing or not? You just do what you have to do. Same thing with my daughter, who's, I think, asleep in the office now. Uh, when she was very young, uh, she was chasing the dog through our house. We had a big golden retriever. And we told her, don't chase the dog. Please do not chase the dog through the house. She, of course, ignored us, continued chasing the dog through the house, and smashed her forehead against the fish tank big gash, blood all over the place. So we rushed her to the emergency room. We didn't think in terms of, okay, you have disobeyed us. You have done something we're not, we've told you not to do. Suffer the consequences. No. You do what has to be done. You don't worry about, is this a good person or a bad person? Is this a good thing that they're doing or a bad thing that they're doing? You just do what has to be done. And that's Jesus' point here. We simply choose to do what needs to be done. You don't think in terms of good or bad. Before the fall, we wouldn't have thought about goodness and badness. We would have simply acted without thinking. Um, for Jesus versus the Pharisees, the Pharisees always thought in moral terms. What is good, what is bad, is this person deserving of being taken care of, is this person deserving of being blessed. Jesus simply helped people. He didn't think about whether or not they deserved it. Paul writes the importance of love and argues in 1 Corinthians 13 that if we give all of our money away, die for the faith, know everything, have no love, then all we did was just so much empty noise. Shakespeare in his play Macbeth says, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and that is heard no more, <coughs> is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Dogs are very good Christians. They don't smoke, they don't chew, they don't drink, they don't run with girls that do. <laughs> they behave very well, they don't hurt anybody. <clears throat> That's not how we determine your righteousness based on your behavior. Love is not dependent upon the actions of the one who is loved. The lover does not see his beloved as she is, but as love says she is. Love always hopes, love always trusts, love always perseveres, and so on. And so the lover sees his beloved as the ideal. She is always without blemish, always thin, always wrinkle-free, the hair never grays, the body never sags. He loves each and every bit of her because it is hers. 
An ideal lover never sees his beloved as any other way but as flawless. He cannot conceive that she can be anything but perfect. She is all that matters, and when she smiles at him and gives, him, gives herself and all other problems fate and significance. There is no fear, no sorrow, no suffering in the arms of the beloved. Our relationship with God is like that. That is, God loves us and gave himself for us. Jesus died for us and everything is paid for. And he sees us through Jesus now. We are completely and utterly righteous and perfect. There is nothing left we have to do. Our relationship with God is not dependent upon our actions. The blessings or bad things that happen to us are not dependent upon our actions. God loves us and takes care of us. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And instead of choosing to enjoy that, sometimes the circumstances of life will distract us. There are two children in Disneyland. I've told the story before. One is happily enjoying himself. They're in Disneyland. How could they not be enjoying themselves? <coughs> And then there's another child that is miserable and crying. This child is in Disneyland. Why is this child crying? Because the child wants the cotton candy and the mother will not buy the child the cotton candy. And so for the child, all it focuses on is the fact that it doesn't have the cotton candy. We can choose to focus on the fact that we're in Disneyland or we can choose to focus on the fact that we lack cotton candy. The only difference is one of perspective. We want to make our lives as pleasant as we possibly can. We want to improve our circumstances. Getting an education, making good choices, these are all positive things. You want to do that. But making the good choices, doing the positive things is not going to change your relationship with God. It is balancing your checkbook is a good idea, but it doesn't have any impact on how much money you actually have in your checking account. That remains the same regardless. Doing good things, there's benefits to that, but it doesn't change your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is dependent upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and there is nothing you can do that's going to alter that. Your relationship with God is dependent on Him, not dependent upon you. And there is a great comfort in that fact that we have had all our sins forgiven. Um, God loves us, and Jesus died for us, not because we deserve it, but because He loved us. We had nothing, it had nothing to do with our ethics or lack thereof. It had nothing to do with begging or asking or anything else. It had everything to do with God's love for us and the price that he paid for us on the cross. And that is a great comfort. There is nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing that can happen to us that will change our relationship with God. We are with him forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you bless us here today ask that you comfort us. We'd ask that you would take care of us as we go out from here. In Jesus' name, amen.